To fully understand the origin of the problem, one must understand the history of the ecumenical patriarchate. The story begins with the first called apostle of Jesus Christ, St. Andrew. After the crucifixion of Christ, St. Andrew traveled to Byzantium and ordained the city's first bishop, St. Stachys, who served from 38 to 54 AD. In 330 AD, Roman Emperor Constantine transferred the capital of the Roman Empire to Byzantium and renamed it Constantinople, or the New Rome. Shortly before this, in 325 AD, Emperor Constantine had convened the first ecumenical council where the Nicene Creed was composed, the canon of the New Testament approved, and the governing framework of the Christian Church established. The Second Ecumenical Council of 381 and the Fourth Ecumenical Council of 451 in Chalcedon recognized the See of Constantinople as one of the original patriarchates. In the 600s, the Patriarch of Constantinople gained the title of First Among Equals and the title of Ecumenical Patriarch. This role continued on through the Great Schism of 1054, when the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches formally split and continues to exist today. For over 800 years, Constantinople had been the most important city in Europe. It was a cultural and economic crossroads and a center for piety and learning. But with the coming Crusades, the Byzantine Empire was made vulnerable to outside forces. On Tuesday, May 29, 1453, one of the darkest days in Christianity, Constantinople was captured by the Ottoman Turks who entered Hagia Sophia and converted it into a mosque. Its beautiful icons were eventually covered with plaster and other religious treasures were looted. This holy site was stripped of its Christian identity, defaced, and covered with Islamic symbols. This defacement and sacrilege continues today as Hagia Sophia serves as a state-run museum that hosts trade shows and musical concerts for the profit of the Turkish government, which currently threatens the existence of the very institution for which this majestic church was built. With the creation of the modern secular Turkish state, it was thought that the treatment of Christians in Turkey would improve, but it has not. The ecumenical patriarch has been victimized by paranoid nationalism and racism that infects the Turkish government and compels it to violate the patriarchate's religious freedom by forcibly closing the theological school at Halki, interfering in the election of the ecumenical patriarch, failing to grant the ecumenical patriarchate legal status, and confiscating thousands of church properties without compensation. This mistreatment contradicts the very agreements which formed the modern Turkish Republic. Turkey has very clear-cut obligations in relation to the patriarchate and also in relation to the Greek Orthodox community and other communities that it itself recognized as minority communities in the Lausanne Treaty of 1923. The Lausanne Treaty of 1923 was an international treaty that effectively gave recognition by all states of uh, Turkey's boundaries and its new republic. But it was based upon an understanding that uh, ancient Christian communities, and in particular the Patriarchate, and in its ability to uh, exist was fully recognized. So under that treaty there are clear-cut obligations on Turkey to observe um, a religious freedom in relation to minorities and to allow minorities such as the Orthodox community to uh, exercise freely its language, its culture, for its children to be educated in their own uh, language according to their own customs at their own expense. All of that has not been recognized over the last 80 years. There's been decades of systematic repression which has left the Greek uh, Orthodox community um, dwindling from about 180,000 to I think about 2,500. The Patriarchate is an ancient institution that for 1,700 years has existed in Istanbul. It's like an eternal candle uh, that notwithstanding all the winds of change continues uh, to burn brightly but it's now being starved of oxygen and the reason why it's being starved of oxygen is not because of the winds of change but because of a systematic policy of Turkish repression which is slowly dwindling uh, the oxygen around that candle and it's now faltering and if things aren't 
done sooner rather than later, irreparable harm and decline will affect not only the patriarch but also uh, the Greek Orthodox community. The Hauki Theological School was founded on the island of Hauki off the coast of Istanbul in 1844. Until its forcible closure in 1971 by the Turkish government, Hauki served as the primary theological school for the Ecumenical Patriarchate, accommodating between 80 and 120 seminarians and theologians at any one time. Hauki. This was a seminary started in the 1800s next to a monastery that St. Photius, and at that time was the ecumenical patriarch, began in the 8th or 9th century. So this is a tradition, a religious tradition, that has gone on on that island where the seminary is for centuries. And yet, in 1971, Ankara decreed that it was an illegal institution and had to be closed immediately. And it was forcibly closed. The school was forcibly shut down. As a result, the Ecumenical Patriarchate does not have an institution, a local institution, to train its clergy. When one compares that treatment to perhaps the treatment of Muslims, who as I understand it are allowed uh, to practice um, their religion in the sense that there are religious schools, there's much greater freedom for, if you like, the majority religions in Turkey. It's a point regarding the legal personality and property rights that all the institutions, the international institutions, have recognized, have pointed out to Turkey as a, as a gross violation of religious freedom, whether it's the U United Nations Rapporteur on Human Rights, whether it's the European Union, whether it's the United States government. All these bodies have told Turkey in no uncertain terms, this must stop. The religious persecution must stop. You need to let the non-Muslim minorities in Turkey live with the same freedoms and rights as the Muslims. Since the school's closure in 1971, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has not been able to train its clergy and has had to send candidates abroad for training. This has proven to be expensive and few priests return to Turkey to minister for the Mother Church. Today, on Turkish soil, the Ecumenical Patriarchate is served by only 15 bishops, two priests, and two deacons. In 1923, the governor of Istanbul issued a scrawny 51-word edict that forever changed the Ecumenical Patriarchate. It required that the Holy Synod of Bishops the body who elects the ecumenical patriarch and the patriarchal candidates themselves be Turkish citizens. In 1970, a second, slightly longer edict was issued by the governor of Istanbul concerning the ecumenical patriarch's election. It built upon the 1923 edict and increased government interference in the election by requiring that the Holy Synod submit a list of three candidates to the governor of Istanbul, who could then remove names from the list as well as install his own patriarch if any restrictions were not followed by the Synod. It seems to me that this constitutes a fundamental interference uh, in the very essence of what the patriarch is about, an ecumenical patriarch uh, which mi ministers not simply to people within the community in Istanbul and in Turkey, but across the seas in Australia, in New Zealand, in America, and even further afield from that. All of those particular areas have an interest in the ecumenical uh, status of the Patriarchate and in the elections to the Patriarchate. And so it's of critical importance, not only to the Patriarch, but to all those other related institutions, that they be freely be allowed to, to um, vote for the next Patriarchate without interference from Turkey. For example, if the Holy Synod wishes to vote on Archbishop Demetrius of America or other metropolitans in the United States or France or Europe or Australia, they should be allowed to do so. But the Turkish government says, no, you're not allowed to do that. You could only vote on a Turkish citizen to be ecumenical patriarch. And not only that, 
we can wipe out any name that you submit to us to, to vote on. So in essence, they are interfering in the canonical structure and order of the church by telling us who we can vote on and who we can't vote on. Uh, we are gravely concerned that the, our brilliant spiritual father, and we wish him decades more of, of spiritual service to our beloved church, but when the good Lord beckons him, who will fill that void? Will we be given instructions by the government of Turkey uh, who is qualified to be the ecumenical patriarch? We are very few now in Constantinople, 2,000 people, less or more. And we are 16 bishops, 15 bishops, more of us are aged, and we must to find a solution if we want to continue the life of the Patriarchate here, from here, to all the Orthodox world. The, the election of the next Patriarch is absolutely critical to um, the survival of the Patriarchate and its ecumenical status. At the moment, there are only possibly 15 other people who, who, who would be eligible under Turkish uh, restrictions with, were the patriarch to die tomorrow. Um, the position is that many of those who are eligible are over 60. There's only one or two who are below that age. Uh, and in order to have a proper, free, and open election, it is absolutely necessary that the uh, selection should include those from the ecumenical uh, areas of, of, of the Patriarch beyond Turkey, so that foreign um, bishops should be allowed to stand and should be allowed to vote. This is of absolute critical importance to the future of the Patriarchate. Without expanding the gene pool, without expanding the electorate and those that can stand for election, there is a great uh, possibility that the Patriarch will be subject to uh, irreversible decline and would have to choose uh, out of a, a very small number uh, and by the next generation that flame will have completely extinguished so it's now or never uh, it has to be confronted it has to be dealt with Turkey's unlawful interference literally has to stop now The Ecumenical Patriarchate is a 2,000-year-old church founded by St. Andrew, the first called Apostle of Jesus. Yet quite amazingly, the Turkish state says that the Ecumenical Patriarchate does not exist. The Turkish government does not recognize the Ecumenical Patriarchate as a legal entity. In fact, the very land that its headquarters is, is based in the Fanar district of Istanbul is not owned by the Patriarchate. Now the reason why the lack of status occurred was because um, the Patriarchate is ecumenical in nature uh, and that is central to its belief and practice but the Turkish state denied that status as a consequence of its Republican and secular policies in which it rejected really any homeland for anyone other than a Turk. And so it ascribed a national religious status to the Patriarchate, which effectively denuded it of any legal personality. That religious status cannot be accepted by the Patriarchate, and as a result of that, there's been no application to fully confirm its status one way or the other. And since the Turkish state deprives um, the uh, Patriarchate of its true identity, it's been unable to enforce any property rights precisely because the state does not ascribe it a legal personality. It goes to the heart of all the claims because as a result of not having legal personality, it can't own property. It then can't actually manage some of its pious institutions which have been transferred to um, uh, the directorate of foundations run by Turks and it also means at the end of the day that it can't 
repair its own buildings, which are in a perilous state of decay at the moment. So it has a fundamental effect on all the related claims, the claims of the patriarchate, and it goes to the very source of conflict between Turkey uh, uh, and uh, Christian communities. After 19, 1933, the Turkish uh, government create, create, created so-called Directorate for Foundations and asked from our minority to give lists of the property of each parish. The Patriarchate and our minority didn't accept, but was obliged to give this list these lists to for recognizing as uh, parishes to have legal status in the Turkey. And at that time, we gave legal state status with list lists to our parishes, monasteries, etc., foundations, orphanage, hospitals, but didn't give legal status to the Patriarchate. The Patriarchate has, until now, no legal status in Turkey. Gave this list, but, and Turkey, Directorate for, for Foundations, obliged to register these uh, properties in the names of our parishes. But didn't know. Le left uh, the ownership of this property the most free. And that after that, same time, municipalities, directorate, state, took without uh, any reason these properties. Of, for example, the school of our parish in Ortakio, in Bosphorus, is in the site, in, in the seaside, one school, a big building, they took from us for another reason, and now they're making hotel. What has been especially disappointing and frustrating to us is that, is that as Turkey continues its negotiations to accede into the European Union, the property confiscations you would think would decelerate, but in fact have accelerated. In 1936, when the foundation law in Turkey, and this is a law that rules all the charitable institutions and foundations and churches, was uh, developed, the church, the ecumenical patriarchate, registered some 8,000 properties that it held. In 1999, the number of properties the church had numbered only 2,500. And from 1999 to 2006, the church has now less than 500. In other words, over 75% of the properties have been lost since 1999. And this is the same period of time where on the one hand, Turkey is negotiating what ought to be in good faith regarding accession to the European Union and adopting Western ideals and shared values. And on the other hand, they are confiscating as many properties as possible. That's not showing good faith. There's no progress, and that's why we're forced to go to make our trips to Ankara, Washington, the European Union, and now forming a legal committee regarding uh, bringing Turkey, the government of Turkey, to the European Court of Human Rights to account for what they have done. When properties are confiscated, oftentimes they are immediately sold to third parties. Many times, the church doesn't even know that they have been confiscated. Three, four of our monastery that we used until now, fused at that time in 67, registered in the name of Directorate for Foundations as own property, and we used, and we didn't know, we never informed that this property, these churches, built churches, belong to the Patriarchate from the 9th century, from the Byzantine time, are registered in the name of uh, a, a Turkish uh, foundation, f f institution, created in 1936, 1935. 
a monastery on the island of Bringipo, so Bayukeda, one of the islands off of the coast of Istanbul in the Sea of Marmara. There was a St. George Monastery there operating for centuries. And it was, <clears throat> unbeknownst to us, confiscated in the 1970s. We, the church, the Orthodox Christians, didn't even know about this confiscation until just a few months ago. So in effect, the confiscations occur without us even knowing it. And not only that, after the confiscations occur, they're often flipped to third parties without compensating the original landowners. This is, this is tantamount to stealing. One, four of our churches took from one defrocked priest and created so-called Turkish Orthodox Patriarchate who don't have believers, faithful priests, nothing. The churches are closed and one of them ran to the Syrian Orthodox Church. They took from us for their flock, for the Turkish Orthodox flock, but no flock. We asked several times from our, from our government, from the Turkish government, to give back this, uh, these churches. But never we received a reply. In these last four, day, four years, the Patriarch and myself, we wrote to the Turkish authorities, Prime Minister, etc., about 40 letters. We never received a reply. <laughs> this is the situation, very sad. And it's an issue that not only involves the church per se, but the institutions related to the church. For example, the Balukli Hospital. The Balukli Hospital is a major medical center in Istanbul that has been traditionally run and operated by the Orthodox faithful in that community under the affiliation of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. This is a 600 plus bed hospital. It has excellent equipment. I'm a physician myself and I've inspected the facility a number of times. They treat between 30 and 40,000 Turkish citizens a year and they have the leading drug and alcohol rehab center in southeastern Europe. So it's a leading health facility that serves the Turkish people. And yet, because it's affiliated with the Ecumenical Patriarchate, it has been victimized in a number of ways by the systemic persecution by the government of Turkey of religious foundations of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Namely, they have confiscated properties that have that the Balukli Hospital has owned. In fact, we have obtained a certified list of properties that were confiscated by the government of Turkey. Street addresses, communities, neighborhoods uh, that we have given to the authorities in the United States government and in the European Union. Within the Turkish legal system, there does not appear to be anything that the Patriarchate can do about it. Since the 1930s, the Patriarchate and related institutions have brought 12,587 cases in Turkish courts to enforce property rights and to prevent or reverse confiscations. The Patriarchate has won less than 20 of these property cases in Turkish courts. It is now being forced to go to the European Court of Human Rights to protect what is rightfully its property. So we have a, a situation in which Turkey, in a systematic manner, and what I mean by systematic is that all, all levels of government appear to, are, <laughs> to appear to be in collusion to asphyxiate the world center of orthodoxy. The parliament passes laws. The executive branch executes these laws, for example, to close Halki and interfere in the election of the patriarch. And the judicial branch uh, codifies these and, and, and gives its judicial approval of these actions. What Turkey is doing is nothing short of institutional genocide. If action is not taken soon, a church that began with St. Andrew the Apostle will end. The plight of the ecumenical patriarch 
has captured the attention of politicians, diplomats, and human rights and religious freedom activists around the world. Regarding religious freedom, um, the European value is absolute freedom and absolute respect. Everybody in the European Union has the right to believe what he or she wants, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Muslim, even you can choose to be a non-believer. All people are equal for the law and should respect each other. I think that is a very core value of the European Union, but also of our Western ally, the United States of America. That is a base of our European cooperation. So if Turkey wants to enter, it is essential that that freedom and respect also shows up here. Um, Turkey could do that because Turkey has a great history of Christians, Christian history, then the Muslims coming, and of centuries living together. And I think Turkey should be proud of that history and really try to once again create this good living together. But right now, I must say to my deep regret that although you are free as a Turkish citizen to be a Christian believer, the Turkish government uh, makes life for the Christian churches very hard, has many bad measures that de facto uh, make Christianity in Turkey almost extinct. And I think that is not good at all, first of all not for Turkey, but also not good for the image of Turkey in the rest of the world. The Turkish government must really give all the freedom to the citizens to believe what they want, but also to facilitate in the same way the various beliefs, not just prefer one belief and work against many others. And uh, I think that is very important. Um, it is something where Turkey really needs to make changes. We saw over the last years that Turkey has done a lot impressive reforms in terms of economics, in terms of abolishment of death penalty, in terms of fight against corruption, in terms of fighting for women's rights. Turkey is really in many ways on the good track, but with religious freedom it's a very sensitive issue. Unfortunately, till now there was no progress. And I think that there now it's very essential that over the next few years Turkey will come closer to Europe in terms of those values. I think, I think if I can say, it's not just important for the Turkish citizens here. It's of course very important for people here that they can believe what they want, but it's also so important for the image of Turkey worldwide. Imagine, we just saw the, the Alki seminary here on the islands we're passing now with our boat. Imagine that the religious schools of Christianity would be reopened and the Prime Minister of Turkey would say, welcome to the new Turkey where there is room for everybody, also for Turkish Christians. It would be the best possible PR for Turkey in the world, the modern Turkey. The West would say, welcome Turkey, you are a friend, we work together with you, welcome in Europe. If on the other hand that would not happen, I think it would work out very negatively for the image of Turkey. I think the treatment is very bad. Uh, there is um, no doubt about it, the facts prove it. It's very bad um, in many ways. First of all, the patriarchate is denied a legal personality which means the patriarchate cannot own buildings, cannot own property, but doesn't also have legal protection. But you and I, as citizens, we are so used to have, the patriarchate doesn't have. Second, the many churches and monasteries are so-called fused, they are taken by the government away from the church, uh, without, even without any compensation. Uh, and third, since 1971, the patriarchate is not allowed to train priests to train the clergy and I think uh, that that is now showing to have disastrous effects for 35 years not being able to educate priests means that the youngest priest now is already very old. When we were at the patriarchate yesterday evening, His All Holiness the Patriarch, he said if something would happen to me we don't know how to select, how to choose a successor because successor has to be a Turkish citizen so you cannot import him for anywhere else in the world but we don't have the candidates anymore because we couldn't train our people. I think that is very bad and in fact unacceptable for a country that wants to become member of the European Union and so I try to make very clear with my visits to the Turkish press, to the Turkish politicians that it is really essential that this practice changes and it has to change rather fast. Let, let, me, um, let me just say also to our friends in the, in the United States
um, I know that the United States is a long-term friend of Turkey. Strategic friend, a military friend in NATO, but a friend in many ways. Like Turkey is a friend of the European Union. What I always say when an undersecretary, for instance, of the USA visits my office in Brussels, I always say when you're a real friend of Turkey, when you want the best for this beautiful country, then use your contacts with Turkey to always give the same message that the future is freedom, Western freedom, and that if Turkey wants to be in the Western world, they have to change. I think we have to work there together. And if over the next few years, the USA and the European Union always give these signals as a friend of Turkey, I hope that if we will meet again in some time here, that I would have a more positive, more upbeat uh, message to, to give to you. That's what I hope. This has been an issue that has not changed. This is an issue that frustrates all the parties uh, seeking redress. And it is our hope that when Turkey accedes in it to the European Union, because we're hopeful that they will, that we, they will embrace the shared values of religious freedom and human rights. And once they do that, the ecumenical patriarchate will thrive. Its elections of bishops and the ecumenical patriarch himself will not be decided on where one happens to live and whose citizenship is being held, but it will be decided by the qualifications and the canonical order of the church. Life today for Orthodox Christians in Turkey is very difficult and is an affront to human dignity. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew and the people who serve at the Ecumenical Patriarchate are preserving a 2,000-year-old institution. They are doing a service to the world's 300 million Orthodox Christians and to humanity in general and deserve to have their rights respected. If you try to taste other things or to follow new ways, this is always a danger. Uh, because uh, you cannot be sure uh, uh, where uh, these ways are leading. So keep uh, standing on a secure uh, terrain. 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 Foundation. Foundation. Uh, we have a very rich spiritual tradition in, in the Orthodox Church. Uh, the fathers of the Church, through their very wise and valuable texts and uh, councils, symbols, mm -hmm. uh, have indicated to all of us, to all the generations, uh, how to live uh, in freedom, spiritual freedom, and in true happiness. How the patriarch and the, uh, the, the bishops, priests, and laymen uh, continue uh, keeping the lamp of orthodoxy lit for the world to see is, is miraculous. Those uh, metropolitans and our patriarch more than anyone else are modern day martyrs of the faith that hopefully will not need to shed their blood for, for the faith, but uh, certainly they're living the life of a martyr. I wouldn't, you know, frankly, people have asked me, could you live there? And I don't really think I could. I mean, it's, it's uh, you feel threatened. I recall um, quietly going to the Patriarchate itself uh, this summer. Um, and uh, I slipped in there unnoticed uh, uh, and I was astonished by the reverence of the place and I went into St. George's and I saw there uh, a young priest singing uh, with an older priest who were conducting uh, some rituals with no one in that church and for 15 minutes with that haunting voice uh, rung out through the church uh, they were unaware of my presence but they went about their duties with a degree of um, holiness that was really quite touching. And then I saw two elderly people come in 
and they meekly sat at the back and instead of going to uh, the front of the pews they almost hid themselves but in reverence uh, looked at uh, what was uh, transpiring before us and then slowly they approached the priest um, and he blessed them but it was a very very touching moment about how this flame is still burning brightly in the Fener district in Istanbul how an ancient people are still uh, practicing their religion but just how delicate and fragile it all is and how that flame may go out not simply because the Greek Orthodox community is dwindling but because the state stops other Orthodox communities other ecumenical uh, Orthodox communities from being able to actually enjoy the religious freedom so I was very touched by that I was very touched by the fact that this young man uh, felt it absolutely essential to be there in Fener to carry on the traditions uh, and I thought and I've seen this in Diyarbakir in southeast Turkey that these are some of the most ancient religions going back through the centuries right through to the time of Christ there is literally a bloodline that starts from the time of Christ right through to this day in these ancient areas these sacred spaces religion is not just about what one uh, believes in one head it is tied to a time it's tied to a place it's tied to rituals it's tied to worships and those rituals and practices are grow up in a culture and they related to a particular place and therefore I think it's very important for the Greek Orthodox community especially here in America to understand where it comes from to understand what its bloodline is but not just its bloodline but it's where its ancient traditions come from and it's not good enough to sit here in America and simply enjoy the privileges that American life gives uh, the Orthodox community and to forget about those young priests, those old priests who are literally uh, preserving their ancient heritage in Istanbul. It is time that Turkey grants the ecumenical patriarchate basic human rights and religious freedoms. It is only then that the precious institution known as the ecumenical patriarchate can be preserved and Turkey can take its place among the world's community of civilized nations. Uh, this is an issue that uh, uh, should be pursued and the, it's for the greater good of the world that uh, um, you know, human rights are respected everywhere in the world. And I think as uh, most uh, human rights activists would say is that you know, the violation of rights in one part of the world diminishes uh, rights elsewhere. Uh, so I think that um, uh, it is a, a matter that uh, is of concern to everyone that uh, you know, r religious rights are being violated in, uh, in Turkey. And uh, uh, it's uh, a case that uh, requires the, the support of uh, human rights activists uh, worldwide. And I'm sure that um, you know, it's going to be a difficult road, uh, but uh, I think it's one where there should be perseverance. And uh, with hard work, uh, the, the matter will be resolved uh, in due course.